I'm Helen Smith, Director of Technology and Media Production at the Eastman School of Music, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Tony Woodcock. Tony is uh, the president of the New England Conservatory, I believe started this summer. Correct. And before that, he ran the Minnesota Orchestra, the Oregon Symphony, and many orchestras in the UK. So I'm very interested to find out more about his background and some of the challenges and some of the lessons learned in terms of running orchestras both in the UK and the US and then how that translates into working in music education and transforming a, a music school as well. So Tony, maybe you could start off telling us a bit more about your work in the UK. Okay, uh, well it goes back, I'm, I'm sorry to say, many, many years now. It goes back 32 years. Uh, when I, I first started, my great ambition was to run uh, an orchestra. And as the uh, Chinese say, be, beware what you wish for, because that finally happened at the very beginning of the 1980s when I was offered the chance of working with Richard Hickox and the City of London Symphonia. Terrific chamber orchestra in London. And uh, I started there as, as, as general manager. And then I had opportunities to run uh, uh, St. David's Concert Hall, uh, the National Concert Hall of Wales. Um, a lot to do with orchestras there, and I'd previously also taught a lot of orchestras. So orchestras were very much part of my, uh, of my blood, as it were. Uh, and then I went up to the, uh, to the northwest and ran the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic and then down to the south coast to run the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra and the Bournemouth Symphonietta. And then, um, virtually ten years ago now, in the 1998, I had the opportunity of coming over to America as a result of some work that a headhunter was doing in California uh, to run the Oregon Symphony. So it's been on both sides of the Atlantic, and it's been what I would uh, describe as a, quite a ride and quite an adventure. And I'd like to talk to you some more about some of those adventures. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I wonder what your first impressions are moving from running UK orchestras to running American orchestras. What were your first impressions, your first thoughts, your challenges? I think I would start with my first uh, um, misperception. Mm -hmm. uh, my first misperception was running a UK orchestra would be very, very similar to running uh, an orchestra in America. And they are really so, so different. Uh, and I'll try and, and characterize that mm, for you. Do. Uh, running an orchestra in, in the UK, uh, you're, you're doing a couple of things, really. You're, you're being the business manager, obviously, looking after the, the best interests of the organization, looking at the budgetary side, looking at, at the management, uh, selling the organization. But you're also looking at the artistic side very, very strongly. Um, there are no music directors per se in the UK that I'm aware of to date, but there are principal conductors, and the principal conductors would be responsible to the, the managing director. And uh, you would form a very strong bond, you would form a very strong artistic team, and you would move forward. And that was always my, uh, my experience in, in the UK. And is that something that is, um, would you say it's a European model, or is it very much specifically a UK model? <laughs> I think it's, it's very much a UK mm -hmm. model, and I think there are, there are some terrific examples of how that has worked as a paradigm in, in the UK. Clive Gillen, some of the other, so I think is a classic case of how successful uh, that can be. Moving to uh, America, there were a couple of things that immediately surprised me. One was uh, the huge emphasis given to fundraising. Because public subsidy is so tiny in this country, although I'll, I'll return to how it's indirect subsidy in, in, in many ways. Right. Um, but there is a need to raise colossal sums of money for the annual fund. And the, the annual fund is it's um, what I would describe as the, the Sisyphus fund. You, you, you roll your stone to the top of the, the hill and then the new financial year starts and it rolls down to the bottom and you start oh, yeah. all over again. So you have to raise millions of dollars as far as that's concerned. And the millions of dollars, um, unlike the UK, where when you were raising money, money primarily came from corporations. It came in the form of sponsorship. 
-hmm. Philanthropy, I don't think, has really been heard of in terms of, of real art support for orchestras. In America, it is completely different. I would say 80% of the money that uh, American orchestras raise comes from individuals, and it comes from individuals for very good reason. It comes philanthropic philanthropically. It's about an individual's or a family's passion for the art form, passion for their, for their community. Only 20% would come from, from corporations. So the exact reverse of what you have experienced in, in the UK. So if you're going to be raising that amount of money, and particularly if you're going to be raising money from individuals, You've really got to be out in the community. You've got to be establishing relationships. You've got to be entertaining, and you've got to be entertaining breakfast, lunch, dinners, and anything else in between those things in order to uh, really allow relationships to burgeon because they, they, that develops as a result of the amount of time and the amount of attention that, that you give it. Uh, my wife was also very surprised uh, in that in the UK, she was Mrs. Manager, in America, she was first lady mm -hmm. of, uh, of whichever community, first lady of the orchestra as, as Mrs. President. And uh, she would be expected to entertain. She would at home, um, at receptions, at dinners, and at functions, and to be very much a, a very strong visible sign of, of the orchestra's president, pre presence in, in the community. Uh, no, she has taken to that and flies with it and is extremely comfortable with it. But to begin with, th those demands and, and that need for the organization came as a surprise. Uh, the, the second uh, surprise was the, the role of the music director. And uh, uh, up until 10 years ago, I was used to uh, uh, a relationship with the, the principal conductor, which would be very collegial, which would be uh, very much a collaboration. But the... In American orchestras, there's a very strong divide between the work of its president, mm -hmm. which let's define that as being um, management slash um, fundraising, um, and the music director. The music director is basically seen as being his, his or her own entity artistically. Uh, so the artistic planning is not so integrated. Uh, it, 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 it can, I, I mean I have looked at this across the country, uh, it can be a very very isolated function within an organization. It can be the a music director saying this is what he or she wants to do, this is their vision, uh, it may not have anything to do with the institutional priorities of the organization, it may not have very much to do with the experience of the of the audience, but I, I think that they uh, are allowed to have that degree of autonomy and that degree of power. Uh, I, I've, I've often um, given a very graphic example of, of that by saying that it's only in America where the power of the ancient pharaohs still resides in the power that people allow their, their music directors. And that has many strong features to it, but it has many weaknesses what as well. What would you say the main impact is, either for good or for bad? I, I, think it, I, I think it has a lot to do with again, a difference between the UK and, and America. Uh, I, I would say in the UK, um, we're a skeptical, skeptical, cynical bunch. Would you agree? I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in America, there's idealism, there's optimism, there's energy. Anything can be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, Americans also have a great predilection for celebrity. They love celebrity. I think it, it's all the genesis of that must have been Hollywood and Hollywood stars and all the rest of it. But it, it's permeated other parts of American life, and it's certainly permeated uh, how they see music directors. And this goes back to Stokowski, to Reiner, to Toscanini, all of whom were fated in a movie star like way. These were heroes, people put on pedestals and given powers. Uh, which very often were inappropriate. And uh, I think that's why uh, we have a union contract for musicians in America, which is a, is a direct reaction to some of the misuses that uh, happened with the very powerful pharaoh-like music directors of, of years past. Um, 
But I, I, I think um, the, 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 the downside in, in all of this, um, maybe the upside you, you would say, okay, you get in real personalities, you get in terrific leadership, you get people in with vision, uh, and that's absolutely true. But you, the downside for me would be that you can enable people not to think of their community and of their audience, but to think of their own uh, personal ambitions for an organization, uh, which may be diametrically opposed to the institutional priorities that an orchestra should be setting itself for the future. Okay, so do you feel that some of the work that you've done with Oregon, with Minnesota, or, or anywhere else for that matter, has been building some of those bridges with the community, has been creating some more connection, some more engagement, and that's a, a place where you started the work? Yeah, I think so. I think it goes back a, a long time in, in my career. Uh, I, w I was thinking the other day, of, uh, education has always been a major, major theme for me. It's something I have uh, tremendous passion for for. Um, and it goes back to, um, I would say, the late, no, probably the, the sometime in the early 80s. I think I gave Peter Weigold, who will be a name that you know very well, his first education job. Uh, and I was trying out people and uh, seeing who would fit and who had new ideas and who could reach out into the community to look at, at how music can communicate, the power of music, the relevance of music. Um, so it's always been a theme with me and with uh, Liverpool and with Bournemouth. We uh, promoted very large scale education programs, community outreach programs that really took musicians and the orchestra and the, uh, our animateurs out there uh, in, in a very real sense. In, in America, I think some of those ideas are still new. And that's one of the things, actually, I wanted to ask you about. You used the word animateur. Yep. And certainly, coming from the London Symphony mm -hmm. Orchestra background that I have, of course, the animateur, the role of uh, education in the community mm -hmm. and outreach was a, a major part of the RSO's yes. work. Yes. Um, and I know that the Philadelphia Orchestra have an animateur, but I'm not sure whether that's something that's really taken off here. Maybe that would be worth exploring what that really means and what the benefits are. Yeah, well, just to give some definition of animateur. Mm. And thank you for picking me up on that one, because I, I know that it's an unfamiliar term oh. here. Animateur uh, was a, a term that uh, was adopted in the UK probably in the 1970s and 80s. It comes from the dance world and the dance world decided that they wouldn't just give performances but they wanted to interact with their communities. And in order to do that they felt that they needed to have the strong creative and artistic involvement of very special people who can perform, who can communicate, who can interact, who can get people involved with interactive activity, not just demonstrating, but actually bringing people into, into a performance, even if they have no experience of performing uh, at all. And they adopted this, this word, animateur, which I suppose the literal translation would be uh, somebody who animates, and that's exactly what these people can do. Uh, they are very, very special people. I've had the great privilege of working with several in, in the UK. Uh, highly strung, temperamental, creative, astonishing people who can go into a special needs school or go and work with um, a, a local city council and produce a project which can help Teenagers at risk can help uh, street children, um, can go into uh, hospices or hospitals and do some astonishing work, but in the sense of an interaction, not a demonstration, not something that's passive, but actually something that uh, can bring people into the joy and into the magic of actually performing. I'll give you one funny example of that. Uh, and it was when I was uh, running the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra on the south coast. And we had to give a presentation to one of our local authorities, one of our funding local authorities. So we managed to get on the agenda. And these local councillors came in. And you could see that you know, they weren't very happy to be there. It was a waste of time. They were expecting a long 
uh, uh, speech from me. Uh, but instead, uh, as they came in, I had our animateur, who was a bass player, and I had one of our percussionists. And as they came in, the animateur was on his bass doing a little walking rhythm. As they sort of came in like this. And then the percussionist was uh, standing by a marimba, just playing one or two notes. And they didn't stop at all. And they all sat down and they wondered what this was. And then we had this huge box of, of percussion instruments. And we had identified uh, some of the, uh, the, the major um, recalcitrant uh, local authority people who uh, we really needed to bring in. So uh, I gave a little introduction over this music. Boom, boom, boom. Good evening. And, uh, this is what we're going to do with you uh, this evening. We're going to really allow you the experience of performing. N none of them read music. None of them performed. And uh, our percussionist threw to one of our most hostile uh, local authority members, threw to him um, um, a percussion instrument. And he picked it up like this. And... There was this rhythm going, and he just indicated the rhythm that this guy needed to play. So, he, And, of course, he was surrounded by his peers, so he was under pressure to do well, otherwise he would be embarrassed. So he started giving this rhythm, which was being indicated by the animateur, and then another percussion instrument was thrown out, and a different rhythm was given. And then suddenly, after about five or ten minutes, the room was full of percussion instruments, like a gamelan orchestra, playing and performing with the bass, improvising uh, with the, all the percussion instruments playing their different rhythms, and very, very exciting rhythms as well. And, and the, the, the marimba accompanying all of this with chords. And that was their direct experience of the power of music and the power that the orchestra could give them. And that's the most powerful thing that you can do, is have people realise that they can be musical, whereas Absolutely. they would never think that they could be. Yes. They wouldn't understand it, they wouldn't feel it, they wouldn't yes. connect with it. Yes. And then just in that short space of time, you would probably completely transform time you would probably completely transform mm -hmm. their appreciation and awareness yep. and support for music yeah and uh, for the, life, the, and, and, and the result was that we had an increased grant from these people exactly and that that was the objective yeah. Now, looking, looking at this country, uh, one of the things I want to explore at, uh, at the NEC is the idea of doing an animator program and linking it to the field linking it to the to uh, the orchestral world and the, the music industry to say, look, we're going to be producing people with new skills who you should be looking at, people who can uh, be extraordinary, can go into your community and uh, create connections that you've never dreamt of and change people's lives mm -hmm. and change people's attitudes. But that needs to be taught from yes, the ground up, and it that's does. probably not happening in a complete sense yet. And one of the things that I was going to ask you is whether you feel yet whether orchestras are in a place to move past. It's not just obviously you have to have excellence is the baseline. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to pass that audition. Mm -hmm. Whether orchestras are now when they're looking for um, new players, whether they're looking at their communication potential, their education, their mm -hmm. technology, their whatever other skills skills they might mm -hmm. have learned at mm -hmm. college. Obviously we know that in higher education we need to teach those now, mm -hmm. but are orchestras actually looking for those yet? Well, to begin with, excellence is not enough. Mm -hmm. excellence, is, excellence is where you start. If, if we are to meet the challenges of the contemporary world in its attitude to classical music, if we are to uh, increase its relevance and if we are to stop it being a peripheral art form, which is the danger that we're facing at the moment, uh, we need to think very differently about how we deliver music and the skills that it takes to deliver music as well. Uh, the, everything is, is, uh, really relates to a union contract. And I'm not being critical of a union contract. You need to have parameters. But the union contract uh, really decides how people are auditioned. And in this country, I would say 99% of people are auditioned purely on the basis of how they perform. Mm -hmm. There are no interviews. Uh, nobody is saying, OK, you can play the violin tremendously well, but what's the whole package? 
-hmm. What's the whole package you can offer this community and this organization? Does the package include your education skills, communication skills? Uh, do you want to become involved with uh, uh, the work of an orchestra in a wider context? Um, are you great at raising money? I, can you entertain people for our development department? You know, what's the whole package? Nobody has gone there. So we know that we need to teach that and mm -hmm. set people up to be at the top of the food chain, I believe, is the yes. way that you put it. But mm -hmm. we need to have the organizations receptive and ready and aware that that's what is out there and could benefit them. Yeah, and in order to reach that point, I, we have to... I think come to the realization that the model that we're using for orchestras is in desperate need of revision and change. And I don't just mean tinkering around the edges, putting on uh, extra coffee concerts or um, uh, drive home concerts or whatever you might call them, which all of which is creative and fine, but doesn't go far enough. Uh, we, we don't need more marketing ideas. We've had a plethora of marketing ideas. Now we need a design change. Mm. And we need to think of the skills of our musicians and we need to think about how we can best use those skills to benefit the community and to come away from the idea that the only audience we serve is a core subscription audience. That has changed. It changed a long time ago. And the field is basically in denial um, over that change. Uh, people still, I've seen them uh, get quite flustered at uh, a terrific report that was uh, produced just a, a few years ago by the Knight Foundation. Right. And I was strongly involved with that when I was with um, the Oregon Symphony. And uh, the Knight Foundation worked with about 15 orchestras in America. They also undertook uh, the most in-depth study of audiences and audience response and community response. And basically they came up with uh, an analysis that showed that when you perform, you're performing to not one core audience, you're performing to a dozen or more audiences. An audience, and if you look at the various layers of the audience, uh, let's say you, you have the music specialists, which may be as small as five or six percent. And, and yet, we, I think, erroneously, we think that that's the audience. They're so, the ones we tend to market to, whether it's yes. the way we write program notes yeah. or the way we, the way we sell subscriptions. Yeah. You, you look at program notes. I mean, program notes are largely indecipherable exactly. by 95% of people attending concerts. Why do we do that? It's an inherent problem in the way we think, and we're still thinking in 19th century terms as far as that's concerned. But you look at those concentric circles of of audience experience. You've, you've got your tiny core audience. You've got uh, audi uh, audience members who have very limited experience, but maybe have heard stuff uh, on, a, on a, a film that they have really liked and they've researched it. Or you have people who are just learning an instrument for the first time. Um, you have people who've been dragged to a concert because their wife or their husband wants to go and they brought people along. You've got people who've been given freebies who are just coming along because it's a cheap night out but you've got multiple layers of, of audience uh, and in the way that we're presenting to them we are still creating all sorts of barriers um, and one of the again one of the major findings in that Knight Foundation report was there is nothing wrong with the art form nobody's gonna say next year huge expose Beethoven symphonies rubbish we shouldn't be playing them you know and this is what we all feel now so that it comes out of the it's not gonna happen uh, but what they're basically saying is it's the it is the vehicle of delivery and it's the vehicle of delivery which we have done nothing about so it's the vehicle that needs to be changed it does I, I think it could be a very very creative process mm -hmm. uh, if if you look at um, um, musicians in an orchestra. If you take the basic contract in America, um, musicians in a 52-week um, uh, orchestra would receive, what, 10 weeks worth of vacations and their normal working week would be about 18 hours. 
uh, level of pay would be in, in six figures. Now you would think that that would breed happiness, contentment, joyfulness and, and uh, a huge zest to play music. In large part it doesn't. And, and why is that? Because people get their artistic fulfillment as very skilled musicians largely outside their workplace. Which is a major statement to make. I think yes. it is. They get it uh, teaching, they get it playing chamber music, they get it uh, conducting their local youth orchestra, they get it conducting their uh, community orchestra, but they get it in other ways. So that's their own individual fulfillment and their own interests, yes. which isn't necessarily fed by the main organisation. Absolutely, the which if you like the, the role of an orchestral musician in, in its purely 19th century form, 19th century form is, uh, is, is one of recreating. It's not creative. And I, let's say an orchestra would use the power of a musician maybe to 40 or 50 percent mm -hmm. of what they are able to deliver. So this is, there's a whole resource of untapped energy Absolutely. There. Which, which I think could mean that music moves back in time rather than forwards in time. Or maybe it moves back in time in order to move forward. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, let's um, think about the role of a musician in Mozart's time or, or uh, Haydn's time or Brahms' time. Uh, now, the, the level of playing probably wasn't as high as it is now. I mean, orchestras have probably never played as well as, as they do now. But we've lost something in that drive for excellence, mm -hmm. in that drive for what I would call the clinical recording method of performance. Uh, and if we go back in time, musicians' lives, I think, were far more varied, far more interesting. Uh, they weren't just specialist on one instrument, they may have been specialist on several instruments. Uh, they would compose, they would arrange, they would teach, they would be in the community. Uh, but we all think about that, those golden times of music. And it's a golden time, absolutely. And it was a golden time for the role of musicians because the role of musicians was far more relevant than it is today. Music was a fundamental part of... It had a role in society. Yes. And there was a real connection with why music, music and musicians were important. Yes. So that's what we need to try and get back to we now. We do, yeah. So with your work with the orchestras so far, have you had a chance to be able to, to manage some, I mean, I'm sure the logistical challenges these mm -hmm. days are immense to try and get that kind of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Were you able to instill some of that? Yes, I mean, I had many, many interesting debates and many, many interesting initiatives as far as that was concerned. But I think what it would mean is, is having the courage to dismantle something. So you have to take it apart and then put it back together. You do, without and, tinkering, you, as you and, say. and and you need you need some real strong research and development mm -hmm. gumption mm -hmm. in order to do that. To to pull to pull it apart in a very constructive way, in a very meaningful way, bringing the musicians into it and the need for it, uh, rather than leaving it where it is at the moment. Uh, leaving it in about 1890, which is where I think it's locked, leaving it in, leaving it in the sense of um, th th this feeling of denial that it, the problems are external to us rather than we are absolutely central to the problems and we've created many of them. Mm -hmm. So what is going to be the key to getting to this point? Does it need some, some kindred spirits like yourself to take that to their organizations? Does it need people from outside the business to, to articulate this? Does it need um, students today to go into orchestras and talk about this? Mm -hmm. well, how do you see this might happen? I, I think it needs to happen with um, a great deal of thought. It needs to happen with courage and it needs to happen with transparency and honesty. Uh, and if we're going to be transparent and honest about it, rather than thinking, oh, we have to keep up a really good PR front here, otherwise uh, sponsors and donors are not going to be supporting us, uh, you have to ask, well, how sustainable is all of this going to be in terms of a financial model for the future without facing up to some of these really intrinsic um, systemic challenges that we have uh, at the moment. So if we are 
going to be honest and, and transparent. Uh, and if we can bring people into the debate and say, okay, this, this is where the, the current trends are going to take us. This is, this is the edge of the abyss at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it doesn't happen to 100%, but it's going to happen to a very large percent. Uh, and we can't do that because we're responsible for this amazing art form, its creation and, and its power for the future. Why think of depriving people of that? And uh, if, if we can draw people into that debate, if we can look at some research and development, if we can get in some major investors, maybe some foundations, to say, yeah, there, there's, there are some new paradigms we can take a look at here without people feeling threatened, without people feeling exploited. Um, and and I, I absolutely don't understand how people can possibly f feel exploited given the, the current uh, uh, the current system, but if if they do, overcoming that and getting in some new thoughts and musicians with a wider skills base mm -hmm. than the one of sheer excellence that we have at the moment. That's not to denigrate excellence, but it's to say that we need to develop from there. Gosh. So how is that going to happen? I'm imagining that you're probably going to be leading that at the NEC. Mm -hmm. I would imagine with some of the orchestral programs, some of the mm -hmm. new ideas that you might be bringing in with the teaching. Yes. Is this, some, this, uh, this kind of ethos, is that something that you would like to continue working on? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I see it across the country here. I see it at so many conservatories uh, uh, owning up to these challenges and thinking about the type of musician they want to train and the sort of skills they need to have to be successful. But more than just being successful, allowing the art form to thrive and prosper for the future as well. Uh, so you hear all sorts of wonderful descriptions of uh, entrepreneurship which I think Eastman is an absolutely classical example of, uh, of that. I hear of those ideas at, uh, at the Manhattan School, at, at Juilliard, and at many others around the country, of looking at new skills for, mu for musicians. And if we can forge a better relationship with the employers, that is, with the orchestras themselves, to say, look, we're alive to this, and we're, we're trying to look at a different skill space for our musicians. We're trying to look at a whole package of what can be offered. Um, we're looking at new programs that might develop the idea of an animateur program mm -hmm. in this country that could really benefit uh, orchestras. Come and be partners with us. Allow these things to happen for our future. So do you see, it sounds to me like you do see that there needs to be a much better, closer connection, a much closer debate between orchestras mm -hmm. and music schools. Yeah, and that, has, and that has not happened to date. I mean, it's happened mm -hmm. maybe in terms of individual relationships relationships, but it's not happened field to field. Mm, uh, that's an interesting question. Now that you have a perspective on both sides, mm -hmm. do you have an idea as to why that might not have happened? Is it just because it never occurred to people or there are a, a major communication issues between the, the two sides of the business, if you like? I think maybe it, it settles into uh, perhaps the, the most dismissive thing that we can do, which is to attach blame you know, it's your fault, NEC, because you didn't train the musicians that we need, and uh, the conservatory saying, "Well, it's your fault, orchestras, because you're stuck in the in the in the 1890s." Uh, so let's get rid of of blame and let's look at opportunity and some really exciting creative ideas for the future. Okay, so I would imagine you must work very closely with the Boston Symphony, so mm -hmm. I'm thinking there must be some collaborations there. At least when we work with the RPO, the mm -hmm. Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, mm -hmm. so I'm thinking that there's also a wider place for the orchestral world and the conservatory world to work in general, yes. I would yeah. think. And maybe we just need lots and lots of models of good practice, really, to break this down. Okay.